Tonight on Free Minds TV, we'll be talking about five reasons to refuse police searches. We'll also be discussing the U.S. economy and artificial social constructs, or eating cats, and why we don't think you should do it, coming up on Free Minds TV. Welcome to episode 243 of Free Minds TV. I think it's season 7, episode 8, somewhere around there. Anyways, it's Toby here with you. And Nick. We've got some stories to get into tonight. Um, some last minute stories. You know, life is busy, so I'm not going to lie. These are last minute stories. They're very last called, minute. Uh, like three minutes ago because working and schooling and internshipping and schooling and working... And life gets in the way. That is not a real TV show, anyway. Yeah, it's so. just, it's just a, a ranting, a therapy session, if you will. So, well, we're going to be talking about the economy because that's always an easy one to. Well, I think these last minute stories might actually be more interesting. Well, you know, my I only picked one story, Nick, and it's about, as you said, this is very interesting. It's about eating cats, mm. or as I like to call it, the artificial construct, social constructs which surround our lives, which we live our lives to, which are silly. Not saying we should eat cats, but I do wish to point out some of the um, the silliness that dictates how we how we live our lives and um, what we choose is right or wrong and what our morals and values are. They are silly if you really break them down and look at them objectively. But first, Nick, let's talk about police searches and why you yeah. shouldn't just say, "I've got nothing to hide, officer. Come on in my house." Yeah. Well, the Huffington Post put up this piece and liberals. Uh, well, they. Uh, they, they, the Huffington Post grabs, new, well, they do what we do. They grab news stories from all over the internet. They've got an agenda, Nick. They do have an agenda. We've uh, got an agenda too, Nick. And our agendas are not really the same, but... Sometimes they are, Nick. Sometimes the Huffington Post gives us these nice soundbite stories. Sometimes we're liberals. <laughs> I guess most people see it that way. You know, I get called like a fascist and... A fascist, like, liberal, anarchist, called, communist. Yes, I've been called all, all yes. kinds of interesting things that don't really go together so some people are very confused by us but I guess let's continue with the story well I'm confused by us too I just want um, to say that the, the fourth amendment number one the number one reason uh, you should refuse police searches or never agree to them um, the fourth amendment to the US Constitution protects us against unreasonable searches and seizures unless police have strong evidence probable cause to believe you're involved in criminal activity they need your permission to perform a search of you or your property you have a right to refuse random police searches anywhere at any time, so long as you aren't crossing a border checkpoint or entering into a secure facility like an airport. So you can say no. They might pressure you very strongly to say yes. They may even search you even if you refuse a search, but as point number two points out, there's still a reason to say no. Refusing a search protects you if you end up in court. It's always possible that police might search you anyway when you refuse to give consent, but that's no reason to say yes to the search. Basically, if there's any chance of evidence being found, agreeing to a search is like committing legal suicide because it kills your case before you even get to court. So don't say yes, even if they're going to do the search anyway, even if they start to do the search and ask you to, you sure you're not okay with this? Just say no. It's probably the best thing to do from a, your own legal self-interest standpoint. Um, just saying no, the number three reason, just saying no can prevent a search altogether. Data on police searches are interesting, but they don't show how many searches did not happen because the citizen said no. A non-search is a non-event that goes unrecorded, so it's not included in the statistic. Well, I'm guessing that that second one kind of leads back to number two. I mean, that third one leads back to number two, because if it... There is, if you do refuse a search and they search you anyways, you can, a good lawyer, there's a good chance that they can get you off. Um, and so it's not really a slam dunk for the police officers there. So kind of makes them sway towards not searching you mm -hmm. if you do refuse, I guess. Mm -hmm. Although, I always thought if you're refusing a search, doesn't that make you more suspicious though, Nick? To the police? Well, what do you have to hide? Refusing a search does not give them probable cause to carry out the search. Well, what are you hiding? Well, it's that's not probable cause. See, no, that's not probable. I mean, if they have probable cause to do the search, when you say no, they can do it anyway. And if they have probable cause, then their case will hold up in court and you're screwed no matter what you do. So if the police have probable cause and you refuse 
and they find something, and it was a you know a legitimate search, then this isn't going to help you. But if any you know, barring that probable cause thing, this comes into play. And what constitutes probable cause is also very uh, open to interpretation by a court. Um, number four, searches can waste your time and damage your property. Uh, do you have time to sit around while police rifle through your belongings? Police often spend 30 minutes or more on vehicle searches and even longer searching homes. And they, as they point out here, once you've agreed to a search, you've basically waived your rights under the Fourth Amendment. So if they damage your property, if they're wasting your time, you, there's no take backs. So if they start throwing stuff around or handling it improperly, or just delaying you, on, you know, for an undue amount of time. Once you've said yes, you're pretty much stuck there. There should be a put back together clause. <laughs> if they don't find anything, they've got to like put well, your clothing or at least back keep in your it drawers. Semi decent. You know, sew just your don't couch talk. back together from cutting it open and stuff. Be nice know, bust it. out the sewing. If they machine. don't find it, just if they don't find anything. Sure. If you're um, innocent. And on the finding thing side, because a lot of people will point out, well, I don't have anything to hide. Frankly, you don't know that. In a vehicle search, in a search of your home, you just don't know that. Especially, I mean, maybe in the, the rare case that you're a mountain man who lives in a shack and they want to search your shack and you, you've been around it for the last two years and you know that nobody has been into your shack aside from you. Maybe in that unique case. Well, maybe you're growing illegal mountain berries, Nick, and you don't know which well, laws have been passed. They don't, they don't talk about illegal mountain berries, but they do talk about <laughs> marijuana here. They point out uh, that you can't be 100% certain that there is nothing illegal in your home or motor vehicle. Uh, you can never be too sure. You know, a, a joint could stick to your shoe on the street, end up on the floorboard, or somebody who is riding in your car, if they had a baggie of marijuana in their pocket, it could easily be underneath the seat at this point. And it's really not that far-fetched. I mean, I always think about that. You know, there are a lot of ways for, for illegal things to get. And sometimes you don't know what's illegal either. There's so many laws on the books. It's not always marijuana or something like that that's obvious. I mean, mm. there are a lot of laws on the books that you can violate unwittingly. Um, so, you know, just assuming that you're in compliance with every federal, state, and local regulation, and assuming that nobody else could have introduced anything illegal into your vehicle, Probably it's not a very smart idea. If you want to do it, that's your business. I mean, you can waive your rights if you want to. They're your rights. I always think back to the story we talked about many years ago about the poor a poor man in Florida who claimed is allegedly he says that he bought this car at a police auction, which he actually did. He got a car at a police auction, and then he was pulled over a while later, and the police dogs alerted that there was drugs. Um, in the car and they pulled off the bumper and found pounds and pounds worth of drugs um, and he went to jail for that and he claimed that that it was already there in the police when he bought the car from the police auction which maybe it was maybe it wasn't who knows but you never know yeah you never I got know. a car from in a most police cases, auction once made me think could have been you know I've heard some stories actually about cars by the auction or actually just any used vehicle you never know what's you know, residue or somebody telling a story about that pistol they found, some drugs. But yeah, it happens. I mean, people leave things behind. You really don't know. When you're, as you pointed out, with a used vehicle, with other people using your vehicle, if you're a parent of teenagers. Ooh, there's a big one. Yeah. I mean, you really don't know what's necessarily in your car or in your home with any degree of certainty. And again, as I pointed out, it's not always marijuana or something obviously illegal like that that they could nail you for. You know, your typical cop might not be, you know, local or state law enforcement officer might not be looking for a lot of the federal regulations. They're probably not even aware of most of the federal regulations. But it just, I, you know, personally, I think it makes sense to err on the side of caution because, frankly, when police are looking to do a search, they're looking to find evidence to convict you and put you in prison. They're not looking to validate, really, they're not looking to validate that you've done nothing. I mean, their job is to find people who are committing crimes, find evidence of that crime, and then arrest the person and take that issue to trial. Well, they don't so if they're looking at searching you, they're trying to find a reason to arrest you. That's just the way. 
not saying police are bad guys. Well, that's their job. Th that's their, yeah, that's the profession they've chosen. That's what police work is. And if you're on the receiving end of that, even if you think you've done nothing wrong, even if you're really pretty sure that there is nothing illegal that they could find, it's not going to, you're not, you're not going to be penalized, I don't think, for refusing a search. Well, it, it, they I don't mean, call it fishing expeditions just because. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're going out there and trying to catch themselves a criminal. And that's what they're paid to do. That's what they're... It doesn't matter to. whether the criminal is a criminal because they, they're enforcing, you know, a possession law. charge or, you know, an actual serious charge, a defense against murder or theft. Um, but, you, you know, even in the case of theft, Toby, I mean, it's easy to become, if you're buying things secondhand, like at yard sales, flea markets, as you pointed out with used vehicles, you, you probably have, you want you need a title for that, but if you're buying things at a flea market or at a pawn shop or anything like that, you may have never stolen anything in your life, but w is there a possibility that unwittingly you might have received stolen property at some point? If you go to flea markets and auctions and things like that, you really can't be sure. Well, I always think about it when people buy used phones on the internet. It's a very good chance. I don't know what the percentages are, but there's a very good chance that those are there, those are stolen. Craigslist, eBay, etc. Um, so, anyways, what are you gonna do? Let's move on, Nick, to social constructs. Most people the think eating cats. The eating, the eating. That's them. all I've heard about this story. Well, it so could I be really dogs or or uh, well, we get okay so horses doing something that's not socially acceptable. Doing something that's not socially. Well, horses acceptable. are uh, yeah, horses are illegal now, and I yeah, thought that was in every state. Ridiculous. Is that all the states? That was a, I believe that was a federal a federal a federal. Act. Well, actually, we're only going over to California right now. Where a poor man by the name of J uh, Jason Luis Wilmer, 35, has pleaded not guilty to two charges, cruelty to animals, and using animals commonly kept as pets or companions as food, citing cites court documents. Now this poor man, I guess allegedly he decided to eat his cat. And that, in the great state of California, is against the law. It looks like back in the old two, no, 1989, Lawmakers decided that thou shalt not eat any companion animals or thou shalt face penalties. Uh, the law was amended in 1998. It makes it against the law to, uh, to use companion animals or animals that are commonly kept as pets for food. Uh, plain and simple, said the police officer in the investigation. Eyewitness News checked the law and found that it does not apply to, quote, any livestock, poultry, fish, shellfish, or any other agricultural commodity produced in the straight state. So goldfish, they're fair game. I guess they're not good enough pets to be on the protected I, I, list. I guess they don't qualify as companion animals. I so can't. on this list would be cats, dogs, ferrets. I can't eat ferrets. Yeah, I, I don't know. What about mice? <laughs> you can eat, your, your snake can eat mice. Right. You can, can kill the animals to feed your other animals. And you eat the mice. <laughs> I don't so know why you want to. So but. here's where it breaks down. <laughs> I am not saying go eat your pets. I think that that's silly and yucky. It's it's like a taboo to me. I don't. But let's be objectable, uh, objective about it. Let's like zoom out of the social constructs in which we live and say, well, why is this? We can eat cows. In fact, we do all the time. Hamburgers, steaks, some delicious food. Cows are the nicest animals of all. I mean... Have you ever been to a cow farm? They're cow so farm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, usually they're referred to as dairies or ranches. <laughs> a cow farm. <laughs> cow farm is an interesting word choice. <laughs> Anyways, carry on. My point being, cows are just nice creatures. They're all like just mooing and eating and chewing on their cud and mooing and eating and chewing on their cud and their big fat eyes and they're just nice creatures who uh, just want to get milked so they don't get mastitis. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty, I, <laughs> pretty nice animals. And meanwhile, we're slaughtering them by the millions and gobbling them up, and it's perfectly acceptable. Meanwhile, we have these animals called cats, who if they were at large enough, would definitely devour us. Yeah. Absolutely, without oh, they a will, doubt. If you die, your house cat will start to eat you oh, yes. not very long. The only so. thing that's preventing your house cat from slaughtering you and your whole family is their small stature. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> <that> <laughs>
mean, it's 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 it is true. I know there are a lot of cat people out there, and if you like cats, that well, let's. It's cool. I'm, I am personally too. a dog person. Cows, dog cows people. may mean children. Not very many. Dogs may mean children. Well, there's quite a few. So, I mean, and I, I love dogs. I mean, I have a dog, a very cute dog. I would never ever think about eating the dog, ever. I'm not saying that, but I am saying a cow can be just as good of a pet as a dog, yet we're allowed to devour them. 4-H kids probably understand this. I grew up on a farm. I used to be heartbroken when my parents would take the, the piglet that I had helped the bottle feed because it was a runt and its mother was gonna kill it if it didn't get bottle fed. And it got big and fat, and then it was time to send it off to slaughter. That was a pet. Yeah. And that was fine. Well, and some people do keep livestock animals as pets exclusively. And, and those people them. are people thought of as crazies. Yeah, if you keep a chicken or a pig as a pet. Yeah, you're so a I'm lunatic. A little eccentric anyway. Maybe not a lunatic. Well, if you keep it in the if house. You, okay, if you, well, yeah, okay, then you're a crazy person. Oh, but we bring these wild beasts of cats a, in the you house. You keep a Yorkshire pig in the house. <laughs> Well, they do make you a ever mess. Yeah. <laughs> you but you know my dog farm. makes a mess, too. You know how hard it is to keep a house clean with a dog, like, really clean? They you shed. Even hairless dogs. Hairless dogs. They shed everywhere, and they make a mess. They chew on their bones, and they, they ruin everything. I, you got to love them still, but I forgot what so I was going here? on this. So the point constructs. is, the social constructs <laughs> in which we live are silly. In China, they eat 4 million cats a year, according to this article from TheExaminer.com. In Cambodia, when beef was ten dollars a pound, they turned to rat meat for only two fifty a pound back in two thousand and eight. In South Korea, dog meat is famous for medical value, for cooling the body and improving uh, vitality. You know, I don't know about that, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying it's just because of the society in which we live believes certain well, things, and this is only a very small part. Very, very small piece here. I mean, we talked about it with the drug laws we have, like alcohol, very, very harmful drug, yet marijuana, less harmful drug, very arguably, the science all points to that, and uh, there's millions of people behind bars because of marijuana. Millions of lives was ruined because, of its and because it's illegal, versus alcohol, which thousands of people die in every year, and it's touted by the state. I mean, the state has a monopoly on it here in New Hampshire. It's the only ones who many, can sell our hard alcohol. Many states have so, yeah, state distributorships. So. so, I mean, the state being a pusher of one drug while they're arresting people for another. I mean, let's just think about the society in which we live and the laws which dictate our, our everyday existence, the, our tax money and where it goes. It's, it's all so silly. I mean, watch one of the presidential debates and just really break down what they're arguing about, and you're just like... Well, especially the Republican debates. The Republican debates really get into that whole culture war. Let's debate every issue of what lifestyle choices does th should the party agree with in its platform and which lifestyle choices shouldn't it agree but with But my in its God platform. is better than your right. God. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the GOP, frankly, they're, I think the GOP is going to be in the decline here in coming years because most people under the age of 30 do not think that way about social issues and the GOP is a dinosaur it's like but the, it's it's clear but it's not just the GOP it is how we tend to think about issues in general Toby it's just yeah. I think the GOP tries to make a lot of political hay out of um, those kinds of like lifestyle choices New Hampshire the all these silly representatives they're like small government out of our lives live free or die but get them involved in gay marriage you right. <laughs> can't have that oh no right because we've seen society start to crumble ever since the gays were allowed to marry in New Hampshire. Maybe that's the reason <laughs> for the loss of jobs, Nick. Yeah, maybe that's the reason the economy hasn't come back quite as quickly. So I mean, a few hundred people were allowed well, to be happier. Well, they're largely debating semantics when they get into the civil unions versus marriage debate. And I think both sides just turn it into kind of this... It's almost like we're, we're, they're looking for that social construct, Toby. And that's why, I mean, frankly, I don't care to see the state involved in marriage at all. I think it's a religious and a social institution, not a government institution. Uh, you used to be married by a church, not by the state. So uh, the whole state marriage thing came into place so we could keep different races from marrying and then so we could you know, keep tackling this same-sex partnership issue. And frankly, I think that's an issue for the churches. The Catholic Church certainly probably not going to recognize gay marriages. Unitarian Universalists, I have a feeling that if you know, they were to make a decision on that as a religious body, 
they probably would. And that's about it. I think marriage is between a man, a woman, a man, a shoe, two men. Well, Whatever God they do or do not believe in. How can a shoe consent? Anyway, I think you think could consent for a shoe. You can. Someone consent. If you want to marry a shoe, I would be fine with that. Maybe you have to find the manufacturer of the shoe. <laughs> and sign it. I, I don't know how it would work in that particular case, but frankly, I don't care. But you're right, Toby. You would think that if you had a principled small government position, you would say, "How is this an issue for government?" Or at least lean in that direction and say that, while well, this is not really a very good use of our time to really debate these issues. And this is what we talk about with the Democrats versus the Republicans all the time. I mean, the, gov the Republicans have it on so many issues. Small government, small government, accept this and accept this. And the um, liberals or the Democrats are supposedly like, government out of our personal lives, accept this, accept this, accept this. I mean, it's hypocritical on so many different levels. And, you know, it's tiring. Uh, yeah, and it's arbitrary. It is, it's arbitrary, too. I mean, it's not like uh, most of what you hear in the political discourse today are ma drawing lines on these artificial constructs that don't really have, they're not internally consistent. The worldviews that are being advocated are just kind of a hodgepodge of, you know, you should do this, you shouldn't do that because we say so. Well, and it's not, there's no real cohesive worldview there's no cohesive core philosophy that's really you know well i think internally that's because consistent. to a certain extent the um national politics and the local politics are are they're a reflection on society and you can argue which came first the chicken or the egg is it the politics that drive the society is it society that drives the politics um i think you have a lot of finger in the wind politicians out there would jump on any bandwagon if they, if they think the voters are there for them. Um, but then again, I think you have some fools who people, for some reason, idolize certain politicians and just change their worldview based on what they see on TV. So chicken or the egg concept, I'm not really sure exactly, but it, it is, it's so silly when you, I mean, I, that's all I can <laughs> think about lately is looking at what we're viewing a society and the, the road we're going down and going, Man, people are silly, and I'm silly in everything I do too. I understand that too. I mean, my life is right. Well, I'm in, caught up in, in this, this case, society as well. So. I think the thing you can is not necessarily to say that there aren't some fundamental values that make sense, oh, but sure. when you think about a case like this, where we're talking about what animals you can eat and what animals you can't, well, it's an arbitrary distinction, really. Now, if somebody had a worldview that said, "I think you should just be able to eat animals, and that's fine," that would be consistent. It would be a coherent worldview, just eat all the animals. We're not gonna, if you can eat this animal, it's pretty equivalent to that one, I don't really see the difference. Or if you have somebody out there who's a vegan or a vegetarian and says, no, I don't really think you should eat animals at all. I don't really agree with that viewpoint, but that's a consistent viewpoint. So, you know, but very rarely do you see societies that have those kinds of, you know, they take a stand on something like that based on some kind of a fundamental principle. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's not. In other it, parts it, of the world, we'd be you'd be horrible to eat a cow. Right. Cows are sacred animals because yeah. they're nice. And dogs aren't treated terribly nicely because they're the mean. <laughs> a lot of them are, and they're not very useful. You have to remember that too. I mean, like, you know, in many parts of the world, an animal that will feed you is a lot more useful than an animal that will eat your food and yeah, you live in a pretty wealthy you. society if you're you're slaughtering your cows instead of milking them. Uh, I mean, that's a cow's worth a lot more in the cheese and milk that it can produce than the, true. Than the well, beef on And that's loins. the thing. Ironically, you know, we've got this, uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with animal welfare, but I think we've got this kind of touchy-feely attitude as a society as a whole when it comes to animals in the way that we feel, not in the way that we actually eat. Because the sure. way we eat, we Disgusting. Americans have one of the most meat-heavy diets in the world, and the way we treat livestock is horrible. I mean, if you want to talk about horrible things, the way we treat livestock is just reprehensible in, in a lot of cases. And a lot of the cheap meat that you get at, whether it's a supermarket or the fast food place, if you saw how it were made, if you had to watch videos of it while you're eating, a lot of you wouldn't be able to or eat. Or even when you're not eating. And I, I mean, think, every I think time I watch one of those videos, I'm like, all right, I'm back to organics. Call my parents, <laughs> all right, I'll take some of that beefalo from your freezer. I'm <laughs> done with the 
the big pharma meat for a little while because it, it is really sick after is, you watch it of how it's produced. The antibiotics that they have to put oh, in the Oh, and these feedlots that just stretch on forever. Thousands of cows packed on these asphalt feedlots. Yeah. Oh, it's very just, sad. The, using bucket loaders to just dump the grain. I mean, it's, it's not a good... No, not nice see. at all. Very miserable existent, f existence for most of the animals, and then we slaughter them. But then again, just going back to our social contracts, what so uh, um, constructs what society says is if you like an animal, if it's if it's nice and you take care of it as a pet, then you're not allowed to kill it. If you're mean to an animal and you treat it like a hunk of meat and it's just in a feedlot and there for our consumption, then it doesn't matter how much it suffers. So I guess that's the idea. I Something like that. It's We're out of sight, out of mind, I guess, yeah. for most people. Uh, that's I, how I, it works for me, anyways. That's why I still eat my hamburgers from the grocery store. Unless I watch one of those videos on YouTube or something, then I uh, take a little I've tried break. to steer towards the better means of production, like free range, but they're more expensive, and frankly, they're not always available. I mean, it's, it's hard to find uh, organic options, or, and organic doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means either, um, but it's hard to find those options. So. Well, anyways, Nick, you wanted to rant and rave about the eco me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to jump into a, a story about the economy coming from the raw story, talking about how stocks, um, the morning we're recording this, took a bit of a, uh, a little bit of a tumble. Um, not that bad. Uh, that was down only 54 points. And frankly, I, I realized as I was That's pulling this really up, I didn't, I didn't really know how, no, not really. I think it's been a slow slow news week. Um, but I, the, the point they're making is that oil prices have been on the rise as they're setting um, you know, several month highs. You've got the, I think last I've seen, it's been trading over 100, um, which is significant. Um, and there is that overall question of just how robust, because we're being told right now, Toby, that we're in recovery. Oof, you know, the markets goodness. are finally you know, starting to gain a little bit of traction. And uh, the real question is, how how real is the recovery at this point, at least in terms of the job market, because we haven't really seen the unemployment rate move very much. Um, you know, it's been about five years since economists would say this financial crisis started. We still got unemployment over 8%. We've still got an economy that's in a pretty fragile position. And higher oil prices could change that equation pretty quickly. So I, fr I live in, you know, I, I earn a living in the U.S. economy too, so I'd love to see better times ahead. I think it's really an open question whether we're really going to see a recovery in the next year. So, ended on a gloomy note. Gloomy. Well, we're then. too lighthearted this this episode, so I felt I needed to end it gloomy. And I didn't but think I think we were lighthearted. I just said uh, the whole world view that we're living in is a farce. It's uh, the bubble <laughs> popping everywhere. That's not a happy view of the world, Nick. That's not warm and cuddly. That's saying every every well, the way you live your life is a lie. But we're gonna live it anyways that way because that's how society works. Oh well, we're I out guess of time. That Send us your emails, your thoughts. I mean, warm and fuzzy. Dark <laughs> Who knows? What do you think? Freemindstv.com. In the meantime, until then, it's been Toby here with you. <laughs> Nick, have a good week.